Good morning. Today's story is from my forthcoming book on the social history of autism. The effect of autism on us. Us, the so-called normal ones. We've always had autistic children. Though they look the same as we do, their toes and their fingers count the same. Their behavior can be so peculiar that they upset we, what we think of as the normal flow of life. 200 years ago, we believed that they were the offspring of fairies, the ever powerful nature spirits. We called them changelings. A changeling, we said, was a substituted child. The fairies have taken your child and put one of their own in its place. It will look like your child, but instead of speaking, it will croak and hum and take revenge on you with obscene tricks. Be warned. Before your baby is christened, don't let him wear green ribbons, for the fairies will see the green and steal him away and substitute one of their own in its place. A changeling has no Christian soul. You must throw it on the fire. The flames will strip it of its enchanted shape so it will have no choice but to fly back to its fairy kingdom. Belief in changelings and its appalling commandment. That belief reigned all through Europe. It was last legally recognized in Ireland in 1895 when Bridget Cleary was killed by her husband who believed she was a changeling. The changeling story I'm going to tell you is partly my own invention, but it rides on the real life account of a 12 year old French boy named Victor. And it was written in 1801 by a young doctor, Jean-Marc Gaspard Itard. In 1969, filmmaker Francois Truffaut, working from Itard's notebook and playing the part of Dr. Itard himself, produced a movie about Victor called The Wild Child. But even as late as 1969, I doubt if Truffaut understood that Victor was autistic. It would take another 20 years for Autism Authority Uta Frith, also working from Dr. Itard's notebook. She observed that all signs of Victor's behavior would be familiar to the parent of a child with typical autism today despite the time difference of nearly two centuries. For a detailed history of Victor, who went on to live well into his 40s under Itard's supervision, I recommend Uta Frith's book, Autism Explaining the Enigma. But the focus of my story today isn't just Victor, but Aveyron, and its frightened superstitious reaction to Victor. Belief in changelings was very much alive in the early 19th century. You can find Victor in Wikipedia, where he is described as emerging from the dense woods of Aveyron, France, a bushy haired runt of a 12 year old, wearing only a ragged undershirt. Wikipedia will tell you that his food references and the numerous scars on his body indicate that he'd lived in the wild the majority of his life. Had he? If so, why was he wearing an undershirt? And how come he knew how to dig potatoes and boil beans? Dr. Itard describes a thick scar on Victor's throat a scar that appeared to be about three years old. Though Itard doesn't question its cause, we can. Did the good folk of Aveyron believe that Victor was a changeling? Had they tried to kill him? 
the thought set me wondering how in an 1801 country byway, enlightenment, witchcraft, and mother love could have played out. Did Victor's mother, knowing that he could live on his own in the wild, let her boy hide in the woods in order to keep him safe from changeling captors? I think of a 20th century father who took me up into the Utah mountains and told me that his severely autistic son would be perfectly capable of surviving there by himself in Utah's snowy woods. Victor was mute. He had no way to tell his mother who were the men who tried to cut his throat. And the men knew it. The only Aveyron man on Victor's side was the abbot of a local monastery, a religious man who was also a history professor. In order to find out how much Victor could withstand the cold, he took the boy out into the snow and undressed him. Far from being cold, Victor began to frolic about in the nude. The abbot concluded that the human reaction to temperature was due to conditioning and experience. The abbot also figured Victor to be about 12 years old. He too dated the knife scar as three years old. But that left unanswered the question, who wielded the knife? Were there others with him? All of them shrieking substituted devil's changeling when the boy slimy with blood had slipped from their grasp and fled into the woods there's a backstory missing gossipy questions that he taught in 1801 may have been afraid to ask and Truffaut in 1969 didn't know enough to explore questions that leave no choice but to invent a backstory. So here's my version of what neighbors might have thought or preached or prayed at a time when changelings ruled the village of Aveyron. Here's what the local priest might have thought. That Sunday, did he demand to know the state of his con congregation's allegiance of their souls? Were they on the side of Almighty God, his holy word against the forces of darkness? Or were they on the side of this demon boy who had no words? Why does he never speak, never look me in the eye? That alone is proof of a substituted child. I caught him back of the vat shed. Look at me, I commanded, I'm your priest, God's anointed servant. Look at me and speak God's holy words. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The devil child, he slithered from my grasp. The next day amid a rustle among the walnut tree leaves, a soft wet chunk of dung struck the back of the priest's neck and rolled into the folds of his cowl. There it was again. Proof. Active proof. Remember the blight on last year's crop? The priest asked his congregation. Let the boy live and before you know it all our cattle will be dead. What did Victor think? Poor little Victor. The village knew he couldn't speak. Was the priest why they shrank from him with startled eyes? Why they marched singing into the dark stone place that towered over the treetops higher than Victor could climb? And he could climb every tree in Aveyron. Folks said they were safe in the dark stone place. If they were safe, why did they get on their knees and eat the body of the man who was the son of God? Victor knew it was only bread. He'd seen the nuns make it, watched the priests put a piece on their tongues, watched how they gulped it down with a slurp 
of the wine that the monks had brewed in the vat shed. Would the priest eat him? Over and over he yelled at him. He didn't belong in this world driving pious folks crazy. Old and over he told him they'd catch him one night with everyone watching and throw him into the fiery furnace that warmed the church. The flames would eat his body and his bones would fly back to the fairy demons. Huh. Victor, <laughs> he knew he couldn't fly. He could only scramble up the walnut tree and pick the nuts that lived inside the big green balls that he and the squirrels knew how to peel and eat the nut inside. The tree was back at the vat shed. If the priest came after him again, he'd be up it in a flash where the priest couldn't get at him. No matter how many times he yelled and prayed and ate the flesh of the man with the nails in his hands. Still, when the priest wasn't around, Victor liked going inside the dark stone place with his mother. She was his friend, leaning against her, sucking on the tag ends of her apron ties. Together they'd slide in all alone. She'd let him light the little candle, and together they'd hold it up to the lady made of painted glass. Victor's mother, what did she pray to the glass lady, the holy mother of God himself? Did she confess to her the second time when the men had again caught Victor, this time chasing him down with ratting terriers, a whole pack of them snuffling through the underbrush? Poor squirrel boy, what chance of escape did he have against their yapping hunger for power? We talk to God, the men had yelled back at her. We celebrate his word. Victor, he don't speak. He has no soul. That didn't seem right. But who was she to know? The neighbors said nothing, but their eyes gave them away. And what was not said was as frightening as what was. Victor's mother longed for the comfort of her own mother. But even her mother took aim. Ha, there's a boy in the next village, a bit like Victor, a per monkey. But he can recite the catechism, backwards and forwards, whichever way you want it. So can a parrot. Ah, may the good God, he dwells in that by boy. Le bon Dieu. Does le bon Dieu tell him what the words mean? Victor's mother saw no way but to fight for Victor and for herself. That boy you call Acroyable, he sits all day in the church steps listening to the matins. That boy can't boil beans, can't dig potatoes, can't even contain his bowels. His mother, she had to stick a serviette between his legs to keep him from staining the stones. You're Victor. He don't wear clothes at all. Don't feel the cold. <laughs> hey, bien. Ça suffit. He is a soulless animal, and the sooner you face it, the better. Face what? What do you want me to face? C'est fini. Over. Terminé. The bishop is holding your boy, and this time they will not miss with the knife. How do you know what the victor will command? Ah, oh, maman! Her own mother had turned away from her and was headed home, kicking at the stones in the hot, sandy path. Victor's mother saw no way but to seek refuge in the church. There, in its cool calm, she lit a candle, folded her hands, and looked up into the glassed face of the Mother of God. Please, that first time three years ago, was Victor's escape from the knife a special dispensation from you? Or am I profanely obstinate? The candle only flickered. Victor's mother recited the words of the old psalm, it was all she could think of. 
He shall give his angels charge over thee. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. But the words of the psalm had turned into questions. Had Victor's wound really been healed by God's angels? Alone in the woods where only the angels knew where he was? Or had she arranged what had happened in order to please the Holy Mother, who surely must know that she was the one who dressed Victor's wound? Did that make her a partner with the devil? Or would the Holy Mother open her arms to her? By some miracle, Victor had survived the attack three years ago. Was she forgiven? Please, did that free her from sin? Today was not the only time Victor's mother had asked the mother of God for a favor. But this time, it was crucial. This time, the local detachment had caught Victor again, and the abbot himself was holding him in the priory. Holy Mother, if you please, would it be too much to ask for another favor? Victor's mother lit a second candle and breathed her needy prayer. Pas de termine. Je prie. Surely the Holy Mother was listening, for another miracle happened. Before the week was out, esteemed doctors arrived from Paris and were conferring with the abbot. Dr. Jean-Marc Itard announced to the village that he wanted to take Victor to Paris to study him for the benefit of medical knowledge. Merci, thank you, thank you, Victor's grateful whisper set the votive candles dancing on the Holy Mother's face. And the abbot, what did he think? What did he have to say about all this? Did he too light a candle to the Holy Mother? Did he admit to her that he was torn between faith in the God he believed in and faith in the new enlightenment, which he also believed in. Did he confess that enlightenment was winning? That it was he who had written to the doctors in Paris? He who had ordered the boy locked up in order to protect him from the vengeance of the faithful? Would the Holy Mother forgive him for deceiving the detachment into believing he'd locked up the boy in preparation for a ritual execution? He knew it was a trick, unworthy of his concentration to Christ. But what else could he do? He'd overheard their drunken boasts, how they would slit Victor's throat, neat as a guillotine severs the royal neck. Did he also admit that he'd fallen into the habit of eavesdropping on the wives of the detachment? that he discovered the hour when they gathered in the priory garden to gossip and had made a point of being on his knees, weeding vegetables, head lowered, shoulders hunched, wearing a dirt-stained smock. That he'd watched the women peer over the priory windowsill to catch a glimpse of Victor, heard them whisper that when the men weren't around, the boy had turned up at their door, looking for food. Yes. They fed him. Mother to mother, they couldn't do otherwise. Shh, finger to the lips. Did their ruminations rouse another prayer in the abbot? If Victor wasn't a substituted child, did that mean he was merely a biological animal and therefore incapable of a human soul? Ah! Now there lay a compromise, one that would satisfy both the Enlightenment and the Church. No, <laughs> alas, more like an invasion, an evasion than a compromise. After all, 
Weren't there plenty of Avignon boys who'd be happy to cavort naked in the snow? Wasn't it part of their passage to manhood? Then came a recollection he couldn't stop himself from confessing. Holy Mother, I saw that he was hungry. I set his plate down. I assumed Victor would eat as a dog eats. Oh, la la. He took the spoon from me and spooned up his dinner. The boy knows how to use a spoon. The abbot's eyes ceased supplicating. Opening his prayer clasped hands, he turned his palms to the painted lady, as if making a point to a drinking companion. Holy Mother, he's only a child, albeit an odd one, and one worthy of medical study, but just a child. I cannot believe otherwise. Let Dr. Itard take him to Paris, and devil catch the hindmost. And what did Itard pray when he finally reached Paris with Victor? Did he wonder what right he had as a fledgling doctor to think that he could turn Victor from an animal into a full-fledged human with a soul? After all, what was a soul? For that matter, what was a full-fledged human? Full-fledged for what? Yet he'd made a deliberate decision to teach Victor to talk, to imbue him with his idea of what it means to be human. Was he no better than Mary Shelley's Dr. Frankenstein, that student of enlightenment uh, who created a monster? Where was Dr. Frankenstein's soul in his undertaking? Did the monster have a soul? An old time saying popped into Itard's head. Man is shaped in body and soul by the tools of his trade. Tools were changing, and already hadn't that changed our interpretation of how they shape us? The lightning rod, a tool to protect our homes from fire caused by a lightning bolt. Had knowledge of that bolt changed our understanding of the natural world? From there, wasn't it but a step to understand the world inside us? Hadn't the invention of the pump taught us that the body's heart is a pump. That being so, couldn't enlightenment reinvent the way we think? The thought was no comfort. Was his need to teach the mute Victor to talk and thereby give him an immortal soul talking louder than his affection for the boy? Was he trying to make his own soul feel safe? as a good Christian and as a believer in the Enlightenment? There was no answer, only questions. But then, there was that secret night when the abbot had hustled him and Victor into a carriage and secured the carriage door. There, Pestra, the abbot had commanded to the driver. And then with a stern look at Victor, he grabbed the boy's small brown thumb. Little bad one. Never forget, the doctor, he is your good Samaritan. He has saved you from a grand gang of on ignorant, ensanglante peasants. With his other hand, he made the sign of the cross. Then, Knowing the bed of hot coals Itard would have to walk once he got to Paris with Victor, the smoldering arguments between Enlightenment and the Church, the abbot cradled both of Itard's hands. Courage, mon ami, my little friend, keep a notebook. The driver slapped the rein. The carriage took off. 
Who knows if any of this happened? There's no record of who said what, nor any record that Victor's mother ever saw Victor again. All we have for proof is that young Dr. Jean-Marc Gaspard Itard took Victor to Paris and that he kept a notebook. The first authentic account of autism.